everyone. We are in the final week of our Future Church series. We're talking about our fourth and final Dream Disciple role. That is a role that we believe every follower of Jesus at Grace is meant to live out. And so we're defining what discipleship and spiritual maturity actually looks like in real life in our context. And so far we've explored these ideas of a compassionate storyteller, a savvy follower, an intentional friend, and today we're going to look at number four, embedded influencer. And I'm going to put the description of this one uh, in the form of our big idea. It says, as an embedded influencer, I understand how God has purposefully gifted and positioned me to multiply his work in the world. Now, I know this word influencer is a bit of a stumbling block for some. It's a kind of a trendy word, and we really considered that as we were putting these together. But here's the thing. It's also a timeless word. It's not like it's a word that, that only, you know, is brand new and it don't, you have to be under 25 to understand what we're talking about. It's not like using a word like chillax or, you know, mansplain or awesome sauce or whatever. We're not doing any of that. The, the word influencer has always meant something and it will always mean something beyond the narrow application that it currently carries. But that all that being said, I also love the idea of redeeming the current meaning of that word. The, the world thinks influencer means this, but in God's kingdom, it means that. And so we kept the word influencer, and we're saying that we believe every Christian at Grace is called to be an influence in the lives of the people around them, whatever family or job or friend group or hobby group you are embedded in. Your role isn't passive in those groups. You are an influencer of others. Now, we've been talking about this important shift that we're making toward missional reorientation, that your life isn't meaningless. You weren't meant to just coast through life. You have a purpose and you were born to live on mission. And way back in week one, I talked through how we've been sent by God. The Bible has a pattern that when mankind is lost, God sends. And we explored the cascading sending in the gospels where, where we see that God the Father sent his son and then the Father and the Son together send the Spirit. But then the Father, Son, and Spirit together send us. And so I want to take you to that passage today at the outset uh, of this message as a reminder of keeping the main thing the main thing. And then we're going to explore a biblical example today of what it looks like to be an embedded influencer. But I want to begin in John chapter 20, starting in verse 19. We're in the upper room with Jesus and the disciples. And it says, on the evening of that day... The first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and he said to them, peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the father has sent me, listen, as the father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus comes back from the dead. His disciples are gathered in the upper room and they're hiding. And Jesus decides to call a staff meeting. It's a Sunday evening, so it's a strange time for a staff meeting. But it was a bit of an emergency meeting. It wasn't on any of their calendars a month ago, but here, here they were. An impromptu Jesus movement staff meeting. And suddenly their leader, who had just been murdered, appears out of nowhere and he goes to the whiteboard to lay out his strategy for moving forward in this new reality. And the word he writes up on the board to get their attention is this word, sending. He says, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. That's the strategy. And that word sending is the word missio or mission. He says, listen, guys, the shape of my life has been sentness. I have been sent on a mission, and now I'm passing that mission on to you. And my mission be must become the model for your life. My mission must become the model for your life. And so his disciples and, and to all of us, Jesus says, now, God's mission is your mission. And God's mission that he's referring to is a rescue operation to reclaim his lost children and to restore the world from all that ails it physically and spiritually because of sin. And Jesus looks at us and he says, here's the plan. Here is your mission. I want as many people as possible all over the world to find a love relationship with God because of my sacrifice. And I want people to hear and believe this good news that new life is available to them through the forgiveness of their sins and their reconciliation to the Father. And so now I'm sending you out to live on mission. 
Now, there are a couple reminders from this passage in John that that I want to make sure that you catch. Here's the first one. Wherever you are, you've been sent there by God. See, as soon as sin entered the picture in Genesis 3, God got to work. He would not allow his children who were created in his image to just fall victim to the darkness. And so he began sending, sending missionaries, sending hope bringers into the darkness. And if you know Jesus, you are now one of those hope bringers. Wherever you are, you've been sent there by ascending God. So yes, you have a job to do and you have kids to raise and you have details to take care of in your life. But his mission to get his kids back now must impact everything you do. Everywhere you are, you've been sent there. You are an embedded influencer wherever you are. So God has a unique purpose and a plan for you right in that place. The Bible says that he knit you together in your mother's womb. He knows you intimately. Paul says you are God's workmanship. You are his artwork, his handiwork. And you've been placed on earth to do good works, he says, which God prepared in advance for you to do. In other words, every human being on earth has a mission. You were put here for a purpose. And when you find your mission, it will set your heart on fire. It will blow your mind. So so God made you uniquely. He gave you spiritual gifts. He gave you skills. He gave you a personality. He gave you dispositions. He gave you many life experiences. He guided your steps to where you live and to where you work and to where you play. And he sent you there with a purpose, with a calling, with a mission. The second reminder from this text is that you have the Holy Spirit to empower you. This is no small statement. The Holy Spirit is God himself, the third member of the Trinity, which means that he carries with him all the attributes of God. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's ever-present. And so as you're living on mission, you have the power of God himself working in and through you to guide you in all you do. Paul, Paul says it this way. He says, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. You have everything that you need. You're not alone as an embedded influencer. And so the question becomes, well, why don't more people live on mission? Well, here's the problem. If you don't know who God has called you to be, then you'll settle for whatever people pay you to be. See, instead of living out God's mission, you'll settle for what John Ortberg calls a shadow mission. And a shadow mission is an authentic mission from God that has been derailed, often in small, imperceptible ways. See, part of what makes the shadow mission so tempting is that it's usually so closely related to your gifts and passions. Like it's, it's not 180 degrees off track, it's just 10 degrees off track. And so when we get under pressure, when we feel stressed out, we tend to revert to our shadow mission. It's become like a default setting that we keep coming back to just off of a click from what, what God wants us to do. And so our shadow mission is often connected to what the Bible calls an idol in our lives. Idols are basically anything that we make ultimate instead of God. And I love this from Pastor Tim Keller. He made this great distinction that has always stuck with me. He called them near idols and far idols. I'm actually going to change the words because I think it's easier to understand. I want to call them surface idols and root idols. Surface idols are those things on the surface that, that, that are visible that we put before God. Things like our looks and, and money and success and toys and relationships. The things that other people can see. But there are root idols that are deeper hidden longings, hidden motivations that allow those things to become ultimate in our lives. Keller suggests that there are four root idols. They are power, control, comfort, and approval. Power is is just a longing for influence or recognition. Control is a longing to have everything go according to my plan. Comfort is a longing for pleasure, and approval is a longing to be accepted or desired. And so many Americans have like a surface idol of money or wealth, for example, But the root issue could be very different from person to person. And so someone with power as their root idol wants more money because of the status money can offer. Or if control is the root idol, well, then money allows that person to eliminate uncertainty and to gain more control of their future. Or a person with comfort as their root idol, they want all the new toys and the creature comforts that money will buy them because comfort is the motivator. And the person with approval as the root idol, well, well, they want the, the, you know, the, the looks and the stares and the clicks and the likes that are going to come their way when they start breaking out all their new toys to win friends. So, so you see how these presenting idols and the root idols can be very different, but they all lead to a dependence on something other than God. And it's important for us to identify those root idols because they're helpful in identifying our shadow mission. 
So is there a calling from God, you know, to have a radical impact on your family during this, dece- this season? But because of your preoccupation with approval, you're just avoiding all the open doors that God's leading to you to, toward your family. Or is there an opportunity for you to run your company in a radical new way based on biblical principles, but because of your obsession with comfort and having an early retirement, like you're keeping the financial margins on full tilt? Or is God calling you to take a risk and to open your home to a, to a book club or a dinner club with a group of neighbors, but because of a, f- a few of them are unknowns and, and maybe they engage in some behaviors that you don't agree with, that your root idol of control is screaming at you. Don't, don't risk losing control of the situation. You see how these idols can, can rear their heads when God places a calling on your heart or places a mission before you. So an embedded influencer says, I understand how God has purposely gifted me and positioned me to multiply his work in the world. And as we think about that role, I want you to turn over to our main text for today. It's in the Old Testament book of Esther. It's in chapter four, starting in verse 11. Esther four, verse 11, and Esther is one of my very favorite books in the whole Bible. It's an incredible story. And as you're getting there, I wanna kinda catch you up with where the story goes. Esther was an orphan. Her parents apparently died, and, and she had been raised by her adoptive cousin named Mordecai, Esther and Mordecai. They were two Jewish exiles living in a foreign land of Persia. And she would eventually become the queen of Persia, but it started with a beauty pageant. No, no one really knew her background or that she was a foreigner till the very end of the story. And they really didn't ask a lot of questions because she was such a beautiful girl. And she got the attention of the king who had sponsored this beauty pageant to choose his new queen. Now, he had gotten rid of the old queen because she wouldn't lewdly parade herself around at a party at his command. He was a real prize. The name of the king, you may know him from history. He's a prominent figure in the movie 300, if you've ever seen that, about the Spartans and their allies' last stand against the Persian invasion of Greece. His name was Xerxes. And so Esther was chosen by King Xerxes to become his next queen. And so she leaves cousin Mordecai and her people. She moves in to the the castle, the palace, and she goes through all that's required to become the new queen. Now, there's one more character that you need to know about. His name is Haman. Haman is the right-hand man of King Xerxes. He's second in command, and he has a lot of power, but it's never enough power. Haman can't ever stop talking about himself. Haman this, Haman that. He wants others to flatter him and inflate his already oversized ego. Finally, Haman works out an arrangement. Whenever he passes by, everyone in the empire must bow down to him in an elaborate tribute to Haman. Now, most people go along with his publicity stunts because they're afraid of him. Nobody wants to pay the price for disobeying his petty little stunts. Well, almost nobody. (laughs) There's one man who decides to defy Haman. It's cousin Mordecai. And Mordecai, because of his faith in God, he refuses to bow down, and Haman becomes furious. Haman starts to do a little digging, and he discovers that Mordecai is of Jewish descent. And, and, And so he bides his time, and he hatches a plot, and eventually he goes to King Xerxes, and he says, he makes this sweeping statement. He says, the Jews are nonconformists. The Jews are insurrectionists. And so it's in the king's best interest. Here's the evil leap. It's in the king's best interest to completely annihilate them by genocide. Haman even offers to finance the project with his own money. Now, remember... Nobody knows that Queen Esther is connected to Mordecai and is also part of this Jewish clan. Well, without blinking, the king gives a nod of approval to Haman's evil plot. And posters are soon plastered all over town saying, kill all the Jewish people. On the 13th day of the 12th month, uh, here's the day, here's the time. If you're going to be a good Persian citizen, and if you have any Jewish neighbors, go ahead and either turn them in or kill them yourself on that day. This horrible hatred that we're seeing it isn't new, it's very old. So Mordecai sees the posters going up and he goes to Esther in secret, knowing that she's the last great hope to stop all this. She has access to the king, even though going to the king would most certainly result in her execution. And so Mordecai and Esther start communicating by messenger and he says, Esther, you are an embedded influencer to the king. And maybe you're in that seat. Maybe you're in that position with that access to that person for such a time as this. And so I want to read you the passage from Esther 4, starting in verse 11. It's, it's their conversation back and forth and her response to Mordecai's cal- uh, challenge through a messenger. It says, 
all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know, she says, that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. And then Mordecai told them to, re to, to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. In other words, God will take care of it another way. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And my young women will also fast as you do. And then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And Mordecai went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. So Esther had been, had been kind of maintaining the status quo. She'd been keeping everything comfortable in the palace. And Mordecai's speech to her was like two hands on her shoulders, shaking her back to reality, saying, God has something more for you. He has a mission for your life. You, you've been sent to this place at this time. You need to go into the king, reveal your true identity, and advocate for the lives of your people before we're all killed. Snap out of autopilot and accept your mission from God. Maybe, just maybe, says Mordecai, you've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. This is your time. Some of you today, you need a similar shoulder shake. Like you've been coasting, you've been maintaining, you've been going through the motions. Some of you are living your lives on autopilot. Your marriage, your job, your family, you wake up, you do some stuff, you come home, you go to bed, you wake up tomorrow, you do the same stuff all over again. And, and maybe today, maybe in God's word, it's a reminder to you that, hey, you're in that seat you're in that position, you're in that relationship, you're in that situation on purpose so that you can live on mission and so that you can be an ambassador for the hope of my kingdom. There's a remarkable principle here that has application to us and it's this. God has perfectly positioned you to influence someone. Maybe right now it's your children. Maybe right now it's a friend or a boss or a fiance. Maybe it's an entire neighborhood. Maybe it's a department at work. But I'll remind you that wherever you're positioned, it's a gift from God. And how you leverage that position is an act of worship to God. And so maybe you are where you are, not to further your own career, not to make more for yourself, but as an offering of influence. And listen, I'm not talking about graduate level influence here. Maybe it's preschool level influence. Like it's, it's a little intimidating to read a story like this about influencing, you know, kings by risking your life. You know, maybe most, most, most of you aren't at that level. Neither am I. And maybe the most influential thing that you could do right now for one of your coworkers is to bake them a couple dozen cookies to demonstrate love in a practical way. Or the influential thing for your neighbor is to send a heartfelt text message of encouragement to them. Or maybe the most influential thing that, that you could do for one of your kids is to lay in their bed an extra half hour before they fall asleep at night and just talk about life. So please don't assume that this only applies to the big stuff. Often the little stuff is the big stuff. But any time you're willing to leverage your time, to leverage your standing, to leverage your credentials, your connections, your money for the good of another, for the, for the poor, for the struggling, for the person in your circle of influence who needs it, like you're living out this role of embedded influencer. And in verse 15, we see Esther processing through the weight of her decision. Then she formulates a plan. And her first instinct in this plan is to fast and pray. She calls on everyone that she knows who believes in God, and she asks them to fast and pray. Three days of fasting among the Jews and among her friends. We talked a couple weeks ago about being a savvy follower, where you position yourself to hear from God, and then you obey God. You do what he says. And we walk through that find your chair tool. Well, well we see Esther here. When the stakes are high, she's turning to those disciplines that are gonna connect her to God. And it's interesting that from this point forward in the story, Esther goes on offense. Mordecai is no longer calling the shots. Xerxes is no longer calling the shots. Haman is not calling the shots. Esther, under God's direction, is calling the shots. 
The season of fasting has given her the power and the confidence that she needs. And from here on, she creates and executes the plan. Sweet little beauty queen Esther, who never ruffles any feathers, she starts giving orders. She is transformed into an influential woman of God, willing to risk it all by standing before a king who could execute her on a whim. Early in the story, Esther's motives were suspect. Her identity was vague. We don't know exactly who she is before God. Now she's sure who she truly is. She realizes that she has been positioned by God for this very moment. And she says with resolve in verse 16, she says, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Esther finally saw her life through a bigger lens. It was a kingdom lens. She, she found her story in his story. And suddenly she realized that her unparalleled access to the king has led to a very specific assignment from God for the good of others. You and I need to take on that perspective too. When is the last time you asked him, God, how can I leverage my life? Where you've placed me, like the access you've given me, the networks you've granted me, the gifts and skills at my disposal. How do you want me to use those things for the good of others? Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 7, 17. He says, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him, has assigned to him, and to which God has called him. You have a calling. You have an assignment. You have a mission. There are people in your life on whom you, you are perfectly positioned to have a spiritual influence. Let me reinforce just a few truths about your influence here. There are gifts only you have. Paul says in Romans 12, 6, having gifts that differ, gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. We have different gifts, but whatever you've been given, use it. Like this comes back to a basic and foundational biblical truth. Every Christian has at least one spiritual gift from God. Now, now when you pair those spiritual gifts with your unique skills, with your personality, with the finely tuned details of your surroundings, to your upbringing, to your life experiences, to your passions and interests, like God has uniquely created and crafted you so that he can use you. There are gifts only you have and you were made to use them. Erwin McManus once said that there has never been an ordinary human being ever born. Yet most of us die painfully and tragically ordinary. We were all born originals, but most die copies. What would it look like to live into your unique giftedness? The, the second truth about your influence is that there are people only you can reach. So, so each of you has a circle. These are, these are your people, your peeps. <laughs> and the, as the old Sunday school mantra says, you're the only Jesus they may ever see. I said a few weeks ago that there are people who trust you who certainly don't trust me, someone like me, even though I'm a pastor, maybe especially because I'm a pastor. The New Testament has a Greek word for this circle of influence. It's called oikos, and now it's a yogurt, but that's not what the word means. What the word literally means is your household or your people. You may remember in Acts 10 and a number of other places in Acts, Peter goes to a Roman centurion in this case named Cornelius to share the gospel. And when he arrives, we find out that Cornelius has gathered his oikos, his people. And when Peter preaches, his whole household becomes Christians. And oikos doesn't just mean his wife and kids. It means his people, the, the brother, the brother-in-law, the dad, the mom, the grandparents, the work associates, the neighbors within shouting distance, the employees. And so when the whole household comes to faith, it was like an entire social network coming to faith. There are people in your life only you can reach. You're positioned to reach them. Third, there are assignments only you can complete. So, so right now, at this stage of your life, there are assignments that God has for you to complete. Are you curious about what they are? I mean, I just want to urge us all, it's time to get curious about the assignments God has for you. You are where you are for such a time as this. There are good works, as Paul said in Ephesians, that God has prepared in advance for you to do. And so one of the things I'm most excited about with this new chapter as a church is that as we've, we've, we've talked about moving the finish line of discipleship outside the walls of the church. And one of the key steps that we're adding to our, to our pathway, to our strategy, is a step of helping everyone at Grace to find their unique calling, to get curious about how God has wired you and positioned you to do the work, uh, to do his work in the world. 
And there's incredible clarity that comes when you start putting words to that calling. In fact, I, I just taught a class recently through this process, uh, trying to hone in on that calling and, and really trying to get it down to a two-word statement. <laughs> we did a lot of digging, a lot of mining through personal histories and online assessments and getting the input of others who are close to us. But when you narrow it all down to two words, two words that reflect your calling no matter where you find yourself. Like, for example, here are my, my two words. After this whole long process, I, I realized God has called me to unlocking potential. That's what God made me to do. Do you know the clarity that comes with knowing whatever room I walk into, whether I'm preaching to a crowd like this, whether I'm training a team, whether I'm with my kids, whether I'm at the gym, whether I'm having a random conversation with an old friend, whether I'm posting on social media, my main contribution to the world, my main calling from God is unlocking potential in people around me. We, we would love to take our whole church, a whole bunch of people at Grace, and really all around our region through this experience called Find Your Calling where you will name your unique calling and then explore what does it look like to live that out in specific assignments in this stage of your life, right where God has positioned you. It's all connected to this idea of being an embedded influencer. And let me talk for a moment just about our collective potential. Because I believe Grace Church is unique in our capacity to in inspire change in our region. Because of our size, because of our reach, we're collectively positioned to bring true change there's nowhere I go these days from one end of our you know, counties to another, one end of our region to another, where somebody doesn't come up to me in a grocery store, in a restaurant, at the gym, on a sidewalk, and they say, hey, you're, you're that pastor at Grace, aren't you? And, and then it'll be quickly followed by, my friend you know, so-and-so goes to your church, or my coworker goes to your church, my boss goes to your church, my teacher, my client, the server at my favorite coffee shop, they, they go to your church, whatever. We're everywhere. <laughs> I walk away just going, grace is everywhere. Our embedded influence goes wide and it goes deep. We're represented and even leading in, in, in many of the sectors of our local community. And in his book, Next Christians, Gabe Lyons talks about the seven channels of cultural influence, he calls them. These are called different things, seven mountains, seven sectors, seven spheres of society, whatever. But the seven are these. It's media, arts and entertainment, business, education, government, church. And the social sector. And when you look at these seven channels through, the, through a lens of influence, like a collaborative effort by all seven holds the power to change an entire society. Like there are many examples of this through history. When massive social change can take place in the span of literally just a generation, if even just a few influencers from each of those seven channels work together toward a common goal. In fact, Lyons says, it takes relatively little time and energy to bring meaningful change to an entire culture, provided leaders from these sectors are working together. And there's one conclusion to his findings that continues to inspire me and honestly haunt me and captivate my imagination. He says that the church, the church, is the only one of these seven that convenes members of the other six every week in one place. Think of the potential. What if we were reminded and inspired and motivated and coordinated in our efforts of our influence represented at Grace Church? And what if people in all of these channels saw that they they could be used not just to advance their own careers, not just to make money for their own companies, not just to advance one little piece of the puzzle, but would advance the kingdom of God. If, if, if we can help you and other leaders of these sectors to discover your divine calling and then send you out to kingdom assignments, guys, we could see this whole region changed. Communities all over the place changed. Heck, we could put a dent in the whole world for that matter. Each of these roles comes with a couple questions, these dream disciple roles. And this embedded influencer discipleship question asks the following. How have I leveraged my unique skills or position for God's mission recently? And what is one situation or person in my life right now that I'm uniquely equipped to influence? That's what we're dreaming about with this future church shift that people would reimagine following Jesus not as something that's done inside the four walls of a church, but is done outside the walls in real life as we become these dream disciples, compassionate storyteller, intentional friend, savvy follower, and embedded influencer. As I wrap up the series, 
One of the helpful pictures that demonstrates this shift. It imagines the church as a house that, that has an upper room and a lower room. The lower room represents why most people come to a church these days. The, the word here is provision. How will this church provide for me? And so if somebody talks about why they like a church, one of the four P's usually takes center stage. It's the place, like the church building is close to where I live. It's a personality, like the pastor is a good teacher. I love the sermons. The third P is the programs. My son really likes going to the kids' ministry, or, or sometimes it's people. Like we go to that church because it's the church our friends attend. And this is where a lot of churches invest their time and energy and resources, and, and we have too. And it's why a lot of people attend a church. When you've heard me talk about kind of the attractional model of church, these are the four factors that attract people to a church. But here's what you need to hear loud and clear. We, we still want to do all of these things really well. We're, we're not saying, you know, now that we're pursuing future church, Derek's sermons are going to be crap or, you know, we're, we're letting our kids' programs deteriorate or something. No, no. We want the lower room to, to continue to be solid. We just want many more people to come to the upper room. Here's the difference. People in the upper room call their church home because they're passionate about how God has positioned their church family to make and multiply disciples, both inside and outside the walls of the church. These people are less about the provision and more about the disciple-making vision. I started this message with Jesus in the upper room with his disciples breathing the Holy Spirit into them and sending them out. And we believe we already have a ton of people at Grace who are living out kind of an upper room faith. But we also know that it's on us to build a very clear and obvious stairway to invite many more people to the upper room. That's what these dream disciple roles are intended to do. And there is much more to come as this vision unfolds. You, you'll begin to feel a few changes around here, I'm sure, as we transition to this model. And we're going to be doing some innovation, particularly over the summer. And then we're going to kick off next fall with a sermon series to give you an update, some direction on where we're headed next. I'm so excited to walk this journey with you guys, following Jesus as we live out God's story every day, everywhere. I love you.